All right, 8.59, that's right, kids, I'm on time. Let's see if we can get into the chat room on time. Welcome to Saturday Fantasy Baseball. It is October, no, is it not October yet, it's September 21st. Boy, am I ahead of myself or what? So we just wait for the chat room to get going here, and then we uh, get on with our fantasy baseball like we do every day of the year, 365 days a year, even on Christmas we do it. Right, Leonard? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So we just, if you're new here, then this is how we do it. You might want to fast forward just a couple minutes, because what we do is we wait for the sound to come through our chat room, which you can join every day at 9 a.m. Eastern. For a live group chat, we love to interact with you guys, answer questions, debate things, and uh, we have a really good time. It's at LennyMilnickFantasySports.com forward slash live. You don't have to sign up. You don't have to give your personal information. We don't spam you. We don't call you. We don't do shit. (laughs) Sometimes we curse. Well, I do. So you can find me on Saturdays cursing away. And yes, the sound is good. Thank you to Eddie. Let me just put a thumbs up in there so everybody knows. Uh, We'll give everybody a chance to refresh so we can have... Like I said, we love to interact with our friends. And um, I was going to tell you that you can find Lenny Monday through Friday at 9 a.m. Then you find me cursing away on Saturdays. And then on Sundays you find me and Lenny Together, we call that show The Lady and the Legend. Good morning to Stevie O, Big Al on the Prowl. Good for you. Okay, Tommy Johnson, we love it. It's so nice that you guys spend your Saturday mornings with us. SM King Turd, Unholy. You know what? Unholy Toledo, I was thinking about you today. I was hoping that you would get to come and listen to my rant. And everybody, the rant will not be till the end because I know some people like to come and just listen to baseball and that's what we try to focus on here. But you know me or if you don't, you're about to find out about me because I have a little rant. It's not a big rant like my old rants used to be. And I figure it like this, you know, I mean, I figure it's fair to say that we do a lot of us come here to escape right the world around us and we just like to talk baseball without having to worry about any kind of disagreements and and cultural differences and all of this stuff and so i i respect that and appreciate that so much but then at the end of the day when you have somebody like me i have stuff to say and i have to say it so you know i'll use my platform on saturdays just at the end And I'll warn you before I say anything bad that might offend you. So that you have the opportunity to leave. And we can all still be friends and you don't have to hate me at the end. So, But I doubt any of you will leave because most of the people that are triggered have already left a couple years ago. I already drove them off, right, unholy Toledo? We're only missing Zelmo, but good morning to Tommy Johnson, Tito Luna, and hopefully Jeter Luna, right? Jeter Luna's here, maybe? SM King Turd. Love it. Rotorius is here, Mets fan. And Laura, I didn't have to yell your name out today. So it's great to see Laura and Mary. Leonard Donaldson, Eddie and Teresa Heckman, Chris Gallo, Big Al on the Proud, Proud, Big Al on the Prowl. And of course, we must say we're just so delighted that this past week, it was a wonderful time for Eddie Heckman and Teresa. They got to meet in person Captain Danny, who, by the way, just got home from his flight and posted in the chat room to let us know he was home safe at 1.30 in the morning, by the way. So we doubt Captain Danny will be in here today, but we love the pictures. King Hap, Beantown Bad Boy went down there. They all got to go to a couple Orioles games, and it was just a beautiful thing. Eddie... You're just such a gracious host, and we just appreciate all of the friends that we've made in this chat room, and we hope to do many more of these, okay? Okay. NL wild card race, all right? How about those Mets? One game behind San Diego, okay? San Diego has three-game lead for the wild card race, and we hope that Malpal will show up today. He hasn't been around since his birthday. I'm starting to think he's trying to avoid us because he knows we're going to 
shower him with love for his birthday. I think that's what he's doing, but maybe he'll come today. I sent him a text, so we'll see. But the the Padres, surprisingly, are right there, three games ahead of Arizona and the Mets. Both the Mets and Arizona are tied. One game, no, wait. Triple play, Boston Paul. Triple play, good morning, Boston Paul, good morning. You helped me, you saved me from my misstep here. It says this, San Diego's 88 and 56 plus three. Arizona, 86 and 68 plus one. New York Mets, 85 and 69 even. And Atlanta, 83 and 71, two. I don't really get how that, I don't really get why it's wrote, written like that. But bottom line, there's four teams competing for a wild card spot. San Diego, Arizona, N- New York Mets, and Atlanta. There have been, all right, so you guys already, I know Captain Danny isn't going to come around uh, this morning. He's sleeping in, but, so he's going to miss the whole segment that we have on Otani. I mean, how do you not have a segment on Otani, right? There's so many tidbits, so many things that he's done, so many accomplishments that he's made. And I know there's a lot of different ways to look at this, depending on which team is your favorite. I know the Dodgers fans are so hyped up saying Otani's the best player that ever lived. But Atlanta fans are saying, big whoop. Yeah, Otani stole 50 and and hit 50 homers. But what about Acuna, what he did last year? He hit 40 and stole 70 bases. It's all a matter of how you look at it. And also, there's another thing that the Atlanta Braves fans like to say, that, you know what, Otani doesn't even play in the outfield. So does that take away his accomplishment? I will say no. I mean... There's been only 120 individual games with at least six hits, okay, since at least 1901. And two of them featured five extra base hits. And both of those two, okay, were from Dodgers. Laura's here. I said hi to Laura. Yes, Turd mentions that Acuna hit 340 and played center field. Boston Paul says, Otani is now the MVP. He changed his mind. So let me, let, me, uh, let me lean into that a little bit. Because Otani now hit 50 and stole 50, he becomes the MVP. What is the MVP? Is, is the MVP the most valuable player on a team? Because if the argument is between Otani and Lindor, right? Would the Dodgers have been in the standings where they are without Otani? I mean, it's easy to say yes, just because of the fact that they have Freddie Freeman, they have Mookie Betts, but you can't take away the 50 homers and the 50 stolen bases. I mean, obviously, Otani has been an absolute monster offensively. But without Otani, would the Dodgers still be where they are? And without Lindor, will the Dodger, uh, the Mets still be where they are? Now, we'll talk a little bit more about Lindor as we go. But I'd like to know, Boston Paul, how you justify that Otani wasn't the MVP before his 50th homer and 50th stolen base. But now that he's 50-50, he is the MVP. All right? I'm hoping you have an explanation for me in the chat room. Now, so I told you that there's only been 120 games with at least six hits since 1901 by one player. There's only been 120 games that one player has hit six hits, okay? So it's happened 120 times, and two of them featured five extra base hits. That means five out of six hits were extra base hits. Both of those were Dodgers. One of them was Otani, and one of them, the other one, was Sean Green in 2002. Otani is the first player with at least nine hits and 12 RBI in a two-game span since RBI became official in 1920. Turd says that the Dodgers would not be where they are without Otani. No chance. And then Turd also says too top heavy of a lineup 
most of this year because Mookie has missed close to 100 games. Isn't that interesting? That's interesting in itself. That hardly ever gets talked about. I guess because they're doing so good without Mookie. It's just he's like a throw. Honestly, I had no idea that Mookie missed 100 games. I guess if I had him on my fantasy team, I would notice more, but I did not. Boston Paul did clarify. He says that Otani is the best player. Lindor is the MVP. Now, Eddie brought up to me this morning in a text that the Orioles are going to choose their most valuable player today. And he wonders if it's going to be Gunnar Henderson or is it going to be Santander? Look, Santander is a keeper. I think the Orioles should sign him, even though they don't have room for him. That's a tough situation. But lately, we want to talk about clutch players. This guy is a monster, okay? And when I say a monster, I mean a good thing. A good, (laughs) a monster hitter. (laughs) All right, hold on. So, Otani leads the National League in home runs, and he has 52 stolen bases, but he doesn't lead the le- the National League in stolen bases. Hey, Turd, who do you think? We're going to ask a trivia question in a bit, and this is the same player, so I'm not going to bring his name up. But, Otani now is the first player to lead their own league in home runs and have more than stole- 40 stolen bases in a season since 1912. And who did it in 1912? It was Tris Spreaker. We're going to talk. It's so funny. Rotorius, you just keep bringing up players that we have on our list to talk about today. You brought up Santander. And then now you're going to bring up Ober. Bailey Ober. We're going to talk about him a little bit. Maybe it will clarify for you. But everybody in the chat room, if you want to help out Rotorius with your opinion, he wants to know if Joe Musgrove or Bailey Ober as a keeper. Good morning to Teresa. Welcome aboard. Otani now leads, okay, he needs 23 total bases in the last nine games to be the first hitter since 2001 to reach 400 total bases. Most stolen bases in a 50 home run season in MLB history. You have Otani with 52, Alex Rodriguez 24 in 2007, and of course Lenny and Unholy would remember this guy, Willie Mays 24 in 1955. The Say Hey Kid. The Say Hey Kid, okay? Scott White from CBS, who's very good, very smart. He's been in the fantasy circles forever. All right. I used to watch him when he was with Lauren Shahadi on the CBS Fantasy Baseball Show. I can't remember the other guy that was on there, but it was Lauren Shahadi, Scott White, and one other guy. Anyways, Turd says Scott White picked Bailey over as a sleeper Cy Young next year. Hey, that's something. Okay. Yes, Tommy Johnston. Shohei Otani is just on another level. Good morning to Merrill. I see you typing. Welcome aboard, dude. All right. Most home runs in a 50 stolen base season in MLB history. Otani, of course. This guy's breaking records like crazy. Acuna Jr. in 2023 with 73. No, the most home runs in a 50 stolen base season. Acuna had 41 home runs in 2023. Eric Davis had 37 home runs in 1987. And Barry Bonds had 33 homers in 1990. Otani has 14 games this season with a home run and a stolen base. And that's the most such games in a season since 1900. This guy is crazy. Like I said, this whole segment is dedicated to the wonderful and talented Shohei Otani. He's the first player with at least four home runs and three stolen bases in a two-game span since 1900. His career high before this season was 26 stolen base. He has doubled his stolen bases, okay, in this year with 52 stolen bases. Now, here's a trivia for my fans and friends in the chat room. The last time a Dodger stole 50 or more bases in a season 
I want to do the Jeopardy. Do, 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 do. Is that the is that the Jeopardy song, Leonard? Yes. No, it's not. I stink. But either way, time to guess. Who is the last Dodgers hitter to steal fifty or more bases in a season? Anthony D. B. Miller is here. Welcome back, Anthony D. B. Miller. Okay, I wanted to say welcome back to you. I'm so grateful that you chose to spend your only day off in eighty four days in with us, and we love having you back. Welcome back. Now, Chris from Cambridge was here. Mitchell is here. Mitchell, both the Hearts and Brothers are here. Great to see you. Boston Paul says Campanella. Eddie Heckman says Maury Wills. Boston Paul says Butler. Who's Butler? Tommy Johnson says Juan Pierre. Uh, Boston Paul says Roberts. I don't think he... I don't think, either way, uh, Mitch Hartson says Maury Wills, Eddie Heckman, Maury Wills. All right, this guy is the last Dodgers to steal 50 or more bases in a season. Brett Butler is who Boston Paul is talking about. Brett Butler, that's not the answer, but good guesses, okay? Uh, it, should I tell you now? Yes, I'll tell you now. Everybody, thanks for playing along. You're doing a great job. It was D. Strange Gordon, okay? He stole 64 bases and only hit two home runs in 2014. Surprised he even hit two home runs. But, yes, it was D. Strange Gordon, who used to just be D. Gordon. And um, so that was the last Dodger to steal 50 or more bases, but he stole 64. Good guess into everybody in the chat room. Now, speaking of the Dodgers, Tyler Glass now. What are we going to do about Tyler Glass now next year, Turd? Okay. 60-day injured list now. Basically, uh, ruling him out for the rest of the season. I mean, if you're on a 60-day injured list, I don't think it's possible that you could even have time to come back. Like, maybe one start if you squeeze it out. I, I just don't see it. I haven't done the exact math. But he did speak to reporter and essentially confirmed that he won't be back in the playoffs. He said it's extremely frustrating to be dealing with his elbow sprain. Though he did indicate that he's confident he's not going to require any kind of surgical repair. So, to the chat room. Would you have been happier if he did get a surgical repair so that we know that he's going to be healthy next year? Or are you fine and just dandy? Or does it make any difference to you at all that he's not having surgery? And the chances, I mean, it obviously it depends. It's an elbow sprain. So I don't really know what kind of surgical repair would even be possible with a sprain. It's, doesn't, it's really not the type of injury that you normally do get surgery. But I'm always a little more confident when a pitcher gets the stuff surgically repaired rather than just letting it heal on its own with time because you never know when it could strike back up and you know we're talking about a guy that um is I guess I don't even have to explain it he pitched 134 innings he threw 22 starts and it was career highs for both of those so that speaks for itself we know that when glass now is pitching he's stellar but let me ask you in the chat room, DeGrom or Glass now next year? DeGrom or Glass now? I'm taking DeGrom. Number one, because I know where he's going in drafts is going to be a lot more um, affordable. But I just, look, you're drafting Tyler Glass now. This guy was the number one pitcher going in drafts last year. And for what reason? Because he was so hyped up in fantasy circles and people loved the fact that he was going to be a Dodger. But he never pitched more than 120 innings in his career in a season. And we knew, and it's not like it's just his third season. This guy's been around for a while. He's played for like three or four teams now. Okay? So what are we doing about Glass now? You have to draft him knowing that you can't expect more than 120 innings, which isn't even that big of a deal anymore. It used to be a huge problem when you said... You know, this guy is not going to pitch 200 innings. But what pitcher does throw 200 innings? There's like maybe three in all of baseball that throw 200 innings. 
And unfortunately for King Hap, Pablo Lopez is one of them. I know King Hap's not here, but he'd still appreciate it. Now, so Glass Now should be about SP20 based on risk, according to Turd. And Turd also says that DeGrom will smoke Glass Now next year. But I should let you know, okay, that Turd has a conflict of interest a little bit here because DeGrom is a Texas Ranger and he is the resident Texas Rangers insider. So take it for what you will. Turd loves DeGrom, but I also agree with Turd. I'm taking DeGrom too because both of these guys are stellar. But DeGrom is even better than Glass now. Okay, in my opinion, DeGrom is a better pitcher than Tyler Glass now. No doubt about it. Now, whether or not DeGrom is ever going to be healthy again, that's a question. And even with 120 innings that you can pretty much bank on for Glass now, you don't really have the capability of banking on 120 innings from DeGrom. I mean, when was the last time you pitched? Okay? So Mitch Hartson says never Glass now, ever. He said that um, he said starting in spring training that the Dodgers would be disappointed with Glass now, and that he would take Pepio back one for one for Glass now. So let's just uh, make a long story short and tell you that Mitch Hartson, one of our smartest guys around, is not a fan of Tyler Glass now. Okay. And uh, Turd says Jacob Degrom will be worth the price next year and next year only. All right, and yes, Mitchell says that they gave a horrible contract to Degrom. I was, I don't know who he's talking about. Mitchell, clarify. Oh, he meant Degrom. He says it was a horrible contract that Texas took on with Degrom, and um, Boston Paul says draft Glass now with a backup plan. I'm just saying, I mean, are you ready to draft Glass now if you already know at that stage of the game that you need a backup plan? But the question really to top all questions about Tyler Glass now is, where is he going to be drafted? That's the question of all questions, right, Leonard? (laughs) (laughs) You know something, everybody? Okay, I have this guy, Leonard, who is... Nobody is a bigger fan of mine than he is, okay? And I told him today, I could say with high confidence that as long as I live, there will never be a bigger fan of mine than Leonard. And I mean, that's an amazing feeling when you have somebody that you're with that you know that they're your biggest fan no matter what. It's just a great feeling, and uh, I, I say... He pretty much taught me everything I know and uh, about doing these podcasts. And uh, I just, I, I try to walk in his shoes, really. But we're a team and uh, we live the dream, right? Oh, for sure. Okay. Moving on back to baseball. We're going to veer off baseball a couple times today and it's all good. Okay. So we're talking about glass now and it struck a lot of good conversation in the chat room. And the question really is, where is he going? And we are going to talk about Chris Sale today, Stevie O. Welcome aboard, Stevie O. Wonderful to see you. And uh, Leonard Donaldson says about round eight or nine for Glass Now. Uh, Boston Paul says $15 and no more. Well, that's interesting coming from Boston Paul because I got to tell you, this guy loves to spend money, okay? Especially when it's in the chat room. But when Boston Paul says no more than 15, that's interesting. Definitely. Eddie asked the question, of course, wants to bring the Orioles back into the conversation. Will Felix Batista be lights out in 2025? I would have, I mean, who could say no? I'm a little disappointed that none of my friends from the chat room partook in a warehouse dog at the Baltimore game. I told you two things. Go in there and get one of those smoked beef sandwiches that you get when you walk in the front door. And then make sure you get a warehouse dog with all the beer cheese and the crispy onions on it. And nobody did it. And they're probably living today because they didn't do it. So (laughs) congratulations to everybody. And I know uh, 
that Danny and Hap and Beantown, everybody had such a good time with you, Eddie and Teresa, and you're just gracious hosts, and you just were there for them when they came in, you were there to get them out, and it was just, it's so nice to see it, okay? We both loved and very much enjoyed it. All right, the only thing we could enjoy more is to be there, but... All right, Glass now says it's extremely frustrating. He did establish new career highs in both innings pitched and number of starts, which I said earlier was 134 innings and 22 starts, okay? So, I mean, his ERA was not uh, elite. It was 3-4-9. His strikeout rate, however, is elite and probably always will be with 32.2%. Now, of course, I don't know why I need to say this, but because everybody knows already that the MLB home run leaderboard is maxed out with Aaron Judge on top at 53 and Otani number two at 52. Let's take a poll. Everybody in the chat room, I want you to say how many home runs and stolen bases you think Otani will finish the season with this year. He currently sits at 50. And 52. The Phillies clinched postseason berth. The Phillies had two four stolen base innings. Okay, that means they had four stolen bases in one inning twice this season. They did it on May 27th and this week. Before this year, they did it last on 2009. All right, great great interaction today. Boston Paul says Otani will finish with 55-55. Mitchell Hartson says 57 homers, 57 stolen bases. Turd says 55-56. Uh, Merrill Hartson says 54 homers, 57 stolen bases. And Tommy Johnson, of course, the forever optimist, says he will finish 60-60. and 60. All right. Yes, great guesses in the chat room. And I think, you know, all of those are relatively close to each other. But 60-60 is exciting. And I mean, this guy's already broke so many records. Thank you, Laura. She says 55 homers and 60 stolen bases for Otani. I see Unholy doing his input soon. Okay. Who has been the best in 2024? Otani with 51 homers, 120 RBIs, 52 stolen bases, and a 1.005 OPS. Mitch says he'd love to see him hit 60-60, but it ain't going to happen with nine games left. But as everybody in the chat room knows, we have one guy that's always an optimist, and he just has a great outlook on life, and that's Tommy Johnston. He says 60-60. Next year, Acuna comes back with 70-70, according to Boston Paul. So you got Judge with 53 homers, 136 RBIs, 10 stolen bases, and a 1.142 OPS. But he's negative 9 in defensive runs saved. So Judge is, for fantasy, a 5-tool player. That's for sure, but he does lack the defense, and it doesn't really matter one way or another to this show because we are specializing in fantasy. Witt, 32 homers, 102 RBIs, 30 stolen bases, a 985 OPS, and he's great defensively, okay? And he's young. Now... Bobby Witt is interesting because, well, he's not so flashy as uh, uh, Otani and he's not so flashy as Judge. He's still, I mean, 30-30, over 100 RBIs with this guy, and he's the eighth player in MLB history with back-to-back 30-30 seasons. So you want to talk about Witt. I, I mean, I get that Otani, I get that, you know, Judge... But next year when you're drafting your team and you're thinking about who's the the guy that's going to most likely give you another matching season, and I'm taking Witt, okay? I get Otani is excellent, and maybe he'll never pitch again, but I highly doubt it. And, I, you know, like we mentioned earlier, Otani literally doubled his high 
in stolen bases this year. He doubled it. So I'm saying that this is a career year for Otani, but who knows that he's like in a league of his own, but I love Bobby Witt and I might draft him over both of those other guys. He uh, is younger and he's done now two straight seasons, 30, 30. Alfonso Soriano is the only other guy to do that. Okay. He, he did it twice, by the way, Alfonso Soriano, had 30-30 seasons in 2002 and 2003, and then he did it again in 2005 and 2006. I lied to you. Bobby Wood Jr. is the eighth player in MLB history with back-to-back 30-30 seasons. Eighth player. But Alfonso Soriano did it twice. He's the only player that did it twice. Now, we'll see if... And Vladimir Guerrero Jr., by the way, did it. And we're going to talk a little about Vladdy Jr. Willie Mays, the Say Hey Kid, did it in 56 and 57. There's a couple others, but we're not going to go into it, all right? Now, I think Otani should just be a closer next year. I mean, it's not like the Dodgers have a great closer situation going on over there. The dude could just... I mean, I think that Otani would be an elite closer, okay? And uh, I'm just saying, if they want to, you know, these people don't think about money long-term, apparently, because they're stretched out so thin. These Dodgers, man, they better hope they keep making a great income come 10, 15, 20 years down the line because they owe a ton of money, right? So I would say, what would be the smart thing to do with Otani? And that would be... To yes, let him pitch, but just make him be the closer. These guys have a lot less wear and tear on their arms, and I do believe he would be one of the better closers in baseball. Quinn Matthews, okay, the minor leaguer for the uh, Cardinals. Quinn Matthews is the second minor league pitcher since 2012 to get 200 strikeouts in one season. Only the second pitcher since 2012 in the minors to get 200 Ks. So he has a 12.8 strikeouts per nine across four levels this season. Here we go about Bailey Ober. Bailey Ober has a 3A4 ERA, okay? And he only and and here's the thing. Let me tell you, Rotorius, and this is why probably that our boy Scott White says Bailey Ober could be a sleeper next year. I wish Mal Pal was here to talk with us about Bailey Ober, but he'll be back eventually. 17 earned runs in only two outings this year. So I know it's not right to, to do this, but if you take out those two horrible starts that Bailey Ober had, he would have a 299 ERA and 165 and a third innings pitch. So basically, baseball is a long season, but those two outings that drove in 17 earned runs for him, they made a huge difference in his ERA. So take that little tidbit for what it's worth. And we will be looking at Bailey Ober more and more going through the off season. But I don't like the fact that Scott White is out there telling people that he could be a sleeper next year because that means that everybody and their mother is listening to that. And what's going to happen to Bailey Ober on the ADP because of this is going to be probably you got to watch out for these because no matter how good he is right I mean there's a lot of times when these pitchers start to get overdrafted because everybody talks about what a sleeper they are and then all of a sudden they're Tyler Glass now being drafted number one overall pitcher and people are going out of their minds on a guy that you know has never thrown a full season in his career just because he's a Dodger now everybody wants him he wasn't horrible I mean, you want to talk about somebody that was a huge letdown for pitching. It was uh, uh, the uh, the guy in Atlanta, Strider, Spencer Strider. He didn't pitch all season, okay? So there you go on that. But anyway, I don't know if that adds perspective. But two starts, a 17 earned runs combined on those two starts, drove his ERA from a 299 to a 384. Now, Lindor, the player of the year, in my opinion, the MVP, and of course, I'm biased because I'm a Mets fan, okay? So there you go on that. But 
Lindor out of the Mets lineup. Now, he missed five straight games. He's got a back injury. They haven't put him out on the injured list. He has been working out. He does have a shot to be back in the lineup today. And that's based on what happened yesterday because he was attempting to go through a full slate of baseball activities yesterday. Now, I don't know what happened. Maybe Laura knows or if you know in the chat rooms, my other MLB Mets fans, let me know how Lindor's workout went yesterday because there is a chance he could be back in the lineup today and if a team ever needed a player to get back in the lineup it is the 2024 Mets all right unholy says that Jamison Tyon has quietly had a very nice year thanks for that tidbit I didn't even know nobody is talking about it okay now, I'll draft Strider next year if he's going to go for a reasonable amount. I have no problem with it. But I still, you know, I like to get deals. And what is a deal really? I mean, that's just all subjective, okay? And you really have to draft team based on needs. And, you know, I'm starting to get away from this idea that I've had since I started playing fantasy baseball, which is to draft Low risk players early, okay. There is no such thing as a low risk player. And Malpal likes to say, and Turd likes to say, these two guys agree on a lot, which is play for greatness, draft for greatness, draft for the best, highest ceiling. Don't draft, you know. Don't don't say you're going to avoid a guy because he doesn't have a lot of experience. If he's that much better than the other guy that's been around for a while, you know, like. Uh, I don't know, Kyle Tucker. In my opinion, Kyle Tucker was the most reliable guy in baseball this this past season. He was one of the most uh, safe, all right? There's no such thing as safe. Kyle Tucker ended up being out for months. It's not going to work anymore for me. This whole safe idea is a bunch of malarkey. However, I, I still can't get over my idea of guys like Corbin Carroll. Okay, who had an excellent rookie season, and then what the hell happened to Corbin Carroll? I'll never draft a guy in his sophomore season based on the season that he had the year before. I just won't do it. I just can't. I can't get over the idea of of the sophomore slam. And as stupid as it is, it happens all the time in fantasy. So. I'm not as risk averse as I was, but I'm definitely still a believer. And a rookie's a rookie, and a sophomore slump is just that. All right. Now, the updated Fangraphs War leaderboard has Otani at seven point five, and uh, and Lindor is at seven point four. Did you hear that, L- Laura? Otani has a F four of seven point five, and Lindor has it at seven point four. Now, we need him to get back in action today. Speaking of the Mets, Luis Angel Acuna had four extra base hits in 57 AAA at-bats in August. He now has four extra base hits in 19 at-bats this month. Okay? 57 at-bats in AAA, four extra base hits in, in August. Now in September, he's got four extra base hits and 19 MLB at bats. We love it. Okay. Now, of course, we have to bring up Kikuchi because Lenny loves this guy. And here's the quote of what he said. As soon as I got traded, my mindset was, I'm going to win every game for this ball club. That's what Kikuchi said when he got traded to the Astros. And now the Astros are 9-0 when Kikuchi starts. Now, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. dropped his strikeout rate, but he uh, and he upped his walk rate, and despite being top 9% in average exit velocity, he had a career-worst 277 batting average on balls in play. Now, the guy that's on X trying to spread some crap about this, saying that he was the unluckiest hitter in baseball, you're definitely not the unluckiest hitter in baseball when your batting average on balls in play is 277. 
Okay, now you see a guy that has like a 209 BABIP. Now that's an unlucky hitter. Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is not the unluckiest hitter in baseball. However, he had a career worst batting average on balls in play because I would assume that his career batting average on balls in play is up in the 320s somewhere, right? So yes, he had an unlucky season, but to say that it was the unluckiest of any player is just ridiculous. So I will say to all of you who think that this cutie pie Vladdy Jr. is not good, that he finished the season with a 322 batting average, 30 homers, Two stolen bases, and by the way, the season isn't finished yet. He still has nine more games to get to 100 RBIs. He's sitting at 99 right now. He's going to hit 600 at-bats, okay? This guy is going to be good. He was just a little late. It was just too much expectations too early. Now, as long as he could keep up his work ethic, which was excellent after his first season, he came back his second season looking trim. You could tell that he was working on all of the holes that he had. This guy has the definite talent, and this kid is such a cutie. I just want to pinch his cheeks. He has the best smile, kind of like Lindor, just a great, happy smile. And as long as he continues to work hard, Vladdy Jr. could come back and surprise everybody, okay? Chris Sale hasn't lost a star since June 27th, and that was a one nothing game. He earned the win on Thursday over Cincinnati, allowing two runs on five hits and two walks across five innings. He struck out six. He failed, he failed to make it through six innings for the first time in eight starts. This guy's a monster. Continues to separate himself as the Cy Young favorite. He hasn't allowed more than two earned runs in any of his last 18 outings. He leads the majors in wins, ERA, and strikeouts. Holy Chris Sale Moly, okay? Through 29 starts, 177 and two-third innings, an ERA of 238 and 225 strikeouts. His last start of the regular season is lined up against the Mets. Okay, and it could be his final start, but we'll see what happens there. James Wood, eighth homer for the Nationals, his 18th homer between AAA and the Bigs to go along with 24 stolen bases. James Wood, getting it done. Now, okay, who is, here's a trivia, okay, the fewest career games to 100 stolen bases and 100 extra base hits. Do, 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 do. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I don't sing good, but it's okay. I still like to sing. Okay, so where's all the guesses? I need some guesses in the chat room. The fewest career games to at least 100 stolen bases and 100 extra base hits. Turd gets it. I think he knew this one was coming. Ellie De La Cruz, okay, 251 games to get 100 stolen bases and 100 extra base hits. Ellie De La Cruz is the third player with 100 or more stolen bases in the first two seasons of his career since the modern stolen base rule was adopted in 1898. He joins Vince Coleman and Ricky Henderson. He's got 65 stolen bases. The Braves' whole team has 64, and the Twins' whole team has 64. And that should do it. I have... All right, that should do it for the day. But, uh... Yes! So, sorry. All right, so here's where you got to leave if you don't like hearing anything, you know, cultural, political, anything like that. It's not really about that, but I just can't stand these sports media vultures and they've just turned into these ridiculous, annoying... I don't know if they're just ignorant. I don't know if they just live... Like, they live in this bubble, right? Where they think everybody 
that is a good person thinks like them. And everybody that is a bad person thinks differently than them. And I don't know if they really believe that or if they're just out there pumping propaganda into the sound waves so that people <clears throat> feel pressured and bullied into thinking the way that they do and doing the way that they do. Because they just love to shame and... and I mean, it, in, over the past five years, it's really come to light. And I guess if you are on one side of the political scale, you don't see it as much as if you're on the opposite side of it because you feel like it's targeted at you because you know it is targeted at you. But it is election season now. And, and it used to be that the athletes stayed out of the political landscape. They were smart. Like, you remember when Michael Jordan said... I want to sell shoes and I'm not going to get involved in this because I want to sell my shoes. And Tiger Woods was asked the same thing. Um, There's been a lot over the years. I mean, the guys that have been watching sports for the longest, like, I mean, the oldest guys in the room, like Lenny. That was a joke, Leonard. He can't laugh because he's sneezing up a storm right now. But it used to be that the athletes stayed out of politics because they did not want their brand to be hurt, which is a smart business choice, okay? But lately, when you got guys like LeBron James and, you know, the whole WNBA is basically all for uh, the Blues. Basically, any athlete that comes out and says that who they're going to endorse, it's always a leftist that they're going to endorse. But the media presents it like the ones that don't want to come out and say anything, like Caitlin Clark recently said she's not going to get into it. She, Her and Patrick Mahomes are the two that are used as examples in this article written by a USA Today reporter that just came out a couple, maybe three or four days ago. But recently, Mahomes and Caitlin Clark were both asked, And they both said the same thing, which is, I'm not going to use my platform to endorse a candidate. I'm going to just tell you to get to do your own research and to go vote. And so that is the answer of the day, to be honest with you folks. That's the smart answer. But the reporters, the vultures, they present it like they're scared to answer, they're scared to endorse Kamala Harris because they're afraid of right-wingers attacking them on their social media. Like, the ones who are the brave ones with the moral fortitude and courage are the athletes that are able to withstand all the right-wing anger and the MAGA crowd coming and attacking them. And that is just simply not the case. That's how they present it, that they're too afraid of MAGA coming after him. And it's just, I see it because, well, I'm a Trump supporter and I don't expect any other people to be Trump supporters, but I see it clearly because it's directed at me. So here's a couple of things that the way this reporter put it in her article that elite athletes are born with unique physical gifts and singular dedication. Moral courage is something they have to find for themselves. And this week was a reminder that not many have moral courage. You hear what I'm saying? They're presenting it like they're too scared to say that they're going to vote for Kamala Harris because the attacks will come out. And the author of this USA Today sports article goes on to talk about Springfield, Ohio City Hall had to be evacuated on Thursday because of a bomb threat sparked by the racist lies Donald Trump and running mate J.D. Vance are spewing. I mean, this is a sports article. And those bomb threats did not come from MAGA. They came from foreign countries. And the governor came out and said that we traced those bomb threats to foreign countries, but nobody cares about that. They never say that because they hold, because it makes Trump and MAGA look bad and they love to call everybody racist that doesn't agree with them. She goes on to say that this isn't a matter of pissing off some of your fans, though. There's a significant number of people in this country who've lost their damn minds. 
And it's understandable if athletes fear the price of speaking out might now be their safety. See what I'm saying? They're basically saying that these athletes refuse to come out and say who they're voting for because they're scared. So basically she says, she goes, one more thing. I'm just going to read you one more quote from the, from the article talking about Caitlin, uh, Caitlin Clark in particular plays in a league where politics and taking a stand on issues are as fundamental as lockdown defense. When the choice for president is between a former prosecutor and a woman of color who is an ardent champion of reproductive freedom against a serial grifter who brags about overturning Roe v. Wade and has a history of racist behavior, it was only a matter of time before the game's biggest star was asked to weigh in. That's how they present these two sides in the sports media, in the mainstream media, in every major newspaper in this country. And I could just say, I'm begging you to please do your own research and vote accordingly, okay? And that's all I'm going to say. But I just wanted to bring that up because nobody else is willing to do it. It's just so sad to see the state of sports media and media in general. But I hope that every one of you has a wonderful day today. It's Saturday baseball. Tomorrow is Lady and the Legend. And we will see you at 9 a.m. sharp.